All right, welcome everybody. So welcome to the uh, Federated Learning One Word Seminar or Flow Seminar. So for those of you attending for the first time, Federated Learning uh, Flow Seminar uh, provides a global online forum for the dissemination of the latest scientific research in all aspects of Federated Learning. This includes, but not limited to distributed optimization, learning algorithms, privacy, cryptography, personalization, communication, uh, compression systems for FL hardware for federated learning, uh, and many more aspects. So today, it's my great pleasure to introduce you our speaker. Uh, our speaker today is Karthik Nanda Kumar, who is uh, Associate Professor, Professor of Computer Vision uh, at Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence, so a colleague of mine. To be uh, like a short video about Kartik, so prior to joining MBCDAI, he was a research staff member at IBM Research in Singapore, also a scientist at Institute for Infocom Research, ASTAR Singapore. And uh, in his research, he's primarily focused in computer vision, machine learning, biometric recognition, and applied cryptography. And today he's going to tell us more about the art of learning uh, together. So thank you, Gardi, for agreeing to give a talk. It's a great pleasure to have you here. And please yeah, take it from here. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Thank you for the nice introduction and for inviting me to give a talk um, in this flow seminar. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, uh, wherever you are. Um, as Sam mentioned, I work as associate professor at uh, MBZ UI. Um, although I'm in the computer vision department, most of the work which I do uh, is related to security, privacy, and trust related issues in machine learning. Um, so today, uh, the, the topic of my talk is on collaborative learning. Um, so I call collaborative learning as the art of learning together. And more specifically, I will be talking a little bit about some of the work we did in fairness, robustness, and privacy issues related to collaborative learning. So at MBZUI, I run this uh, lab called Sprint AI Lab, which basically stands for security, privacy, and trust in AI. So if you are interested in collaboration or if you are looking for some research positions, uh, either as a research assistant, postdoc, or things like that, please feel free to contact me. Okay, so when you talk about federated, learn, uh, federated learning or collaborative learning, the whole idea is to allow multiple entities to collaborate in order to solve a machine learning problem. And the key thing here is, we want this collaboration to happen by keeping the raw data locally and exchanging only some kind of focused updates, which are then aggregated, right? The core premise is that the shared updates, usually uh, things like gradients, uh, which are getting shared among the participants in a collaborative learning framework, um, it is believed that these gradients do not reveal the raw data or the updates should not reveal the raw data. So the privacy is one of the key concerns here. And the other key assumption that we make is all the entities involved in the collaboration are honest and curious. What do we mean by that? So they are not trying to sabotage the learning process, um, but at most what they can do is try to infer private data from whatever the updates were being shared. Right? So that's basically the threat model uh, assumed in most um, collaborative learning settings. And the most well-known collaborative learning setting is called a self-related learning, where the idea is you have multiple clients and a server, and you want to learn something from the data which is available at the clients. So during each iteration or each round, you basically pick a set of active clients. Um, these clients start with a global model, run some local updates or local computations to get some updates. And these updates are shared with the server, which does all the aggregation and sends back um, the new global model to the next set of active clients uh, to speak in the next round. So this is the typical federated learning setting. So why do I... Um, title this talk as the art of learning together. So I, the inspiration comes from uh, nature where you have this art of living together. And there are various ways of living together in nature. So uh, this process is called symbiosis for people who don't know about uh, um, biology, right? So these kind of symbiotic relationships can be of many types. So what 
we usually assume in a federated learning or a collaborative learning setting is what we call as mutualism, in which um, the organisms which are having a relationship, they benefit from each other. For example, in this case, you have a clownfish and a sea anemone. So the sea anemone provides uh, protection to the clownfish, uh, and then the clownfish, uh, um, by giving up its waste, uh, it's helping uh, supplying nutrients to the sea anemone, right? So both these organisms have a mutually beneficial relationship. So this is typically the setting which we consider in collaborative learning. But then nature also has many other types of um, relationships. One of the most common ones is uh, commensalism, where you have one organism that benefits while the other uh, receives no benefit or harm uh, during the process of interaction. Right. So, for example, in this case, you have these uh, birds called cattle egrets. So, these birds just they just travel on top of the cattle and then they try to eat the insects which come out as the cattle moves around. Right. So, in this case, the birds are benefiting, but uh, the cattle uh, or the whatever animal that is carrying these birds, they neither benefit nor they are harmed. And then there's this next type of uh, relationship, which is called as parasitism, which probably most people will know, uh, where one organism really benefits while the other is uh, harmed, right? A typical example is like a mosquito or a leech, which tries to suck the blood of the uh, animal it is, uh, which is hosting it. At the same time, um, so basically the host gets harmed, whereas this parasite uh, enjoys all the benefits. And finally, you have the scenario of competition where both organisms are competing for the same resources. Right? So in this case, you have this lion and the hyena. So they have a similar type of prey and they are both trying to attack the same prey or they're competing for the same prey. Right? So uh, in nature, there's all these different types of relationships, whereas in collaborative learning, most of the um, work is focused on what is known as the mutualistic behavior. So the motivation for my work comes from uh, the fact that can we design effective collaborative learning frameworks for these various non-mutualistic scenarios for the different things which I described, like common cellism, parasitism, and uh, competition, right? So how do we design collaborative learning frameworks for these kind of non-mutualistic scenarios? And it turns out that um, apart from the traditional federated or collaborative learning objectives, which typically focus on things like accuracy, which means by collaborating, I should be able to uh, gain something in terms of having a better model compared to not collaborating, right? So that is what we call as accuracy. The second aspect is privacy, which means uh, I should not leak any information about my private data during the process of collaboration. And finally, I need to be able to do this collaboration in a very efficient manner, both in terms of uh, communication as well as computational efficiency. Okay, so these are some of the traditional objectives studied in the uh, federated learning literature. But if you want to design systems for these other kinds of non-mutualistic scenarios, then we need to look at uh, a few other aspects. So one of the key things that we need to focus on is called as collaborative fairness, which means Somehow the benefits derived by the participants should be commensurate to their contributions. Right? So, I mean, this is a um, ideal scenario which everybody would like to have in a uh, federated learning or a collaborative learning ecosystem. So whatever contributions the participants make, they should be able to derive benefits out of it, uh, which is proportionate to their contributions. The other aspect that we want to achieve is called as Byzantine robustness, which means if some of the collaborating entities turn out to be uh, malicious in, in terms of exhibiting parasitic behavior, which means they want to um, get all the benefits without actually contributing anything, right? Or you are intentionally harming the other participants, right? So we need to be able to develop algorithms that are resilient against this kind of parasitic behavior. So these two, uh, additional properties, collaborative fairness and Byzantine robustness are very important if you want to uh, extend collaborative learning to non-mutualistic scenarios. So in this talk, I'll mainly talk about uh, a couple of works that we did uh, in these two areas, along with uh, one other, I briefly touch upon one of the privacy uh, related work that we did recently.
Okay. Uh, in terms of collaborative fairness, so we talked about benefits, right? But how can we give um, how can we give benefits to the participants? It can be either in terms of financial payoffs or incentives, or the other way to do it is to have differentiated models. So basically, each participant uh, in a collaborative setting gets a differentiated model. Uh, this has varying levels of accuracy. For example, somebody who contributes more gets a model with a very high accuracy and somebody who contributes less gets a final model, which has, which still is better than its local model, but it has much less accuracy compared to the uh, highly contributing participant, right? So that is what we call a fair, a fair system. And usually collaborative fairness is quantified based on the correlation between the contribution of the participants and the rewards received, right? So now there are two variables here. First, we need to be able to evaluate what is the contribution of the participants? And then we need to ensure that the rewards which are received by the by these participants is uh, proportionate. So basically there's strong correlation between the contribution and the rewards. So in our work, we mainly focus on uh, the differentiated models um, in the sense like we are not looking at financial incentives uh, thus far. So we are mainly focusing on delivering differentiated models such that uh, a highly, um, highly accurate final model will equate to a better reward in our system. So the key question that needs to be answered is how do we uh, quantify the contribution of the participants? Because the rewards received can be easily uh, quantified based on the final model accuracy, right? So we have a metric for that. But what is the metric for the contribution of the participants? So that is a key challenge that needs to be solved. Okay, um, so in terms of uh, algorithms, we, uh, we were one of the first to propose this kind of collaborative fairness. Um, this was the work which was started by my intern when I was at IBM Research. It started around four or five years back. Um, so she was working on this problem and now she has, uh, I mean, all the other papers which I described in a previous uh, slide, right? Uh, so Ling Wan Liu was my intern like four years back. She was. She continues to work on this collaborative fairness issue. Okay, so basically, we, in our initial work, we did not consider a typical federated learning setting, which we call as a distributed setting in our paper, where you have these multiple participants, they all send updates to the server, which aggregates it. So instead, we consider a fully decentralized kind of setting, which means the participants directly talk to each other, right? So if I want to, um, exchange gradients, I directly exchange gradients with the other participants rather than uh, sending them to the server and the server aggregating it, okay? And this exchange can happen through various ways. Uh, you can do this through encrypted channels. You can do this through multi-party computation protocols. Uh, you can also do it via other platforms such as blockchain. So one of our initial works kind, kind of considered data exchange through a blockchain, okay? Um, so essentially, I want to emphasize that we are focusing on a decentralized setting. And um, so these two publications, which are listed here, um, describe some of the work which I'm going to show uh, in the next few slides. Okay, so our key idea was, okay, now I want to evaluate the contribution of uh, the different participants. For that, uh, we define what is known as the credibility of a participant. and. So we've, at the start of the algorithm, it's a basically a two-phase algorithm. So we want to do an initial credibility estimation of the different participants, and then keep updating this credibility estimate as time goes by, as the, as the different rounds of communication happens. To do this initial credi uh, credibility estimation, the idea that we came up with is generating a synthetic evaluation set for each participant. And we did this using a, a generative adversarial network or a GAN, a network, which we try to modify it such that it is differentially private. So essentially we want to generate a synthetic data set which does not leak much information about the original data distribution. So we use this uh, DP GAN or the differentially private GAN uh, in order to generate these synthetic samples. And once these synthetic samples are generated, we, each participant publishes these samples or exchanges these samples with the other participants. So the other participants take these samples 
since um, they have a local model with them because each participant is assumed to have some data to learn some model. So these, uh, these other participants will make predictions on this uh, synthetic evaluation set and send back the predictions back to the uh, querying party. So in this case, let's say the querying party is uh, participant is party one. So then party one publishes the synthetic data set and all the other parties respond with their predictions. And based on these predictions, we can estimate the credit, uh, we can get some local estimates of the credibility of the participants. Okay, so if, let's say if participant two gives me a very accurate prediction on my data set, then maybe participant sh two should be given a higher credibility than the other participants. But then um, I would like to emphasize that this is just a local view, right? Um, it might turn out that the distribution, the data distributions between the different participants is completely non-IID. So in that case, um, what I estimate as credibility of the other participants might be completely uh, off from the other participants estimates of uh, their credibility. So this is just a local credibility estimation. So the next step is to uh, aggregate this local credibility values into some kind of uh, global credibility. Basically, this is done by um, each participant kind of uh, having a, like a consensus kind of algorithm where each participant publishes their local credibility estimates about the others. And these numbers are uh, aggregated in some fashion in order to get a global credi credibility value. So then what do we do with this global credibility value? So that's where the crux of the algorithm lies, right? So what we do is the global credibility of a participant actually decides how much information it can receive from others. So in this case, what we did is uh, we said the amount of information that is received from others can be uh, quantified in terms of the number of gradients that are being shared. So typically when you have a federated learning setup or a, a, um, a decentralized learning setup, you share gradients and gradients of the more local model, right? So, but then these gradients, you know, you typically try to specify it in base for communication efficiency and also for privacy is based on your privacy requirements. So in this case, we define um, the number of gradients that can be received by the other participants by based on their global credibility. So if some participant has a high global credibility, they are allowed to download more gradients from the other participants. And that too, they can bid for gradients, right? So they can pick and choose uh, which party they want to download from. So let's say if my local view is such that I believe more in party four than party three, then I try to or try to bid for more gradients from party four, which allows me to learn faster. Okay. So, and then this is not a one-way process. So the, once you make a bid, the other participant can respond to this bid and they can respond uh, based on their privacy budget. Right? So each participant has a privacy budget. So that decides how much gradients they can send. So let's say party one can ask party four for, uh, let's say 50% of the gradients, right? But party four can say, okay, based on my privacy budget, I can provide only 20% of my gradients. And that too, they can decide the quality of the gradients. So typically we have um, some for differential, for privacy reasons, we add differentially private noise uh, on top of the gradients. So that determines the quality of the gradient. So essentially the number and the quality of the gradients will be determined by the privacy budget. So the other participants can respond to different bits based on um, the request from the parties and then also their privacy budget. So once this is decided, so there's some kind of agreement uh, is established and then the party one downloads a specific number of gradients at some specific quality from the other party, uh, participants. Right, so then we kind of continuously evaluate the uh, reevaluate or uh, reestimate the local credibility of the other participants. So this is done by uh, using the leave one or leave one gradient out method. So what does that mean? So let's say I am party one. I receive gradients from three other parties, two, three, and four. So what I would do is I will leave one gradient out and measure what is the impact on my accuracy. Right. So if I aggregate three, all the three gradients, I would have a certain accuracy. If I drop one of the gradients, what is my accuracy? So if the, my accuracy is not impacted, 
um, significantly, then it means that the gradients received from that party is not useful for my learning, right? On the other hand, if there's a significant impact on my accuracy, so if I drop the uh, gradient from participant four, if my accuracy drops significantly, then it means that uh, party force gradient is very important for my local learning. So we use this leave or not method to uh, update the credibility of the different local participants. So this proceeds in multiple rounds, right? So each time uh, the participants estimate the local credibility of others, then they learn a model. And then the next time, uh, based on their credibility, they involve in a consensus protocol to get a global credibility. And then based on the credibility, they can exchange the gradients and this process continues. So uh, we found that uh, this kind of mechanism uh, kind of worked quite well. Uh, so we trusted it on many uh, data sets like M MNIST and uh, SVHN data set. Uh, so the key thing is like, as I mentioned before, well, how do you measure the contribution, right? So we initially we are using a very, very uh, primitive or a naive metric where basically we say assume all the data is IID. So in that case, the data set size of the local participant and also the sharing level, which is actually determined by the privacy budget. So if you have the high privacy budget, then you can share more gradients. So which means you're sharing more information. So you're contributing more, right? So the data set size and the sharing level actually uh, are used as proxies for quantifying the contribution of a participant. And we found that um, when you use this kind of contribution metric, uh, contribution assessment, and then we look at the final accuracies of the model. There was a very strong correlation. So as marked in these uh, green boxes. So this is the case where we use this uh, proposed framework, uh, which is pair and differentially private uh, distributed deep learning framework. So it had a very high correlation. So if you don't use the framework, if you use something like a simple DPSTD, uh, differentially private STD, or a red averaging kind of models, the, um, we mostly get either zero correlation between uh, your contribution and your final accuracy, or sometimes even the contribution is negative. So let's say if there is a participant, uh, which is kind of a free rider, it doesn't have any data, it just sends some random gradients uh, every time. So it's contributing nothing to the uh, learning process, but still it will get one final uh, model, fun global model, which is fairly accurate, right? So in that sense, you have a negative correlation between your contribution and the, your final accuracy. On the other hand, if you use the proposed protocol, you get uh, fairly very high correlation, which shows that the proposed method is fair. Of course, we also need to look at the accuracy. Uh, so we compare the accuracy of the proposed method with uh, different kinds of uh, frameworks. So centralized refers to centralized learning where all the data is pulled together uh, at one server and the learning is based on and a typical machine learning model. Then the distributed is a simple case of uh, federated learning um, where we use a DPSTD kind of algorithm for distributed learning. Standalone is if you just use the local data to train your model. So we showed that there is significant gain, performance gain um, compared to the standalone model. So this here we refer to what is called as a maximum accuracy because these participants are kind of non-IID they might have different kinds of data and then different levels of accuracy. So we, what we are looking at is the maximum accuracy achieved by any one of the participants. So in the case of standalone, and they are training just based on local data, you achieve a low accuracy of only 53%. On the other hand, the centralized and the distributed approaches give you much better accuracy. But when you apply this, the proposed method, which is the fair and uh, differentially private uh, distributed learning, so you, there is a marginal drop in accuracy, roughly one to 2% most of the time. Uh, but then um, this is reasonable given that you are able to achieve much, uh, much better fairness. Okay. And we try this for different kinds of, uh, different uh, types of uh, variations. Right? We vary the sharing level, we vary the data set size and so on. And we are able to still achieve the same level of accuracy. So overall, the theme is that you get fairness. There is a marginal drop in accuracy, but uh, it's still a significant collaborative gain. Okay, so the key question that comes up is, um, so the kind of contribution assessment that we have used is very naive. 
are there better methods for valuing valuing the data right and more recent papers have talked about better methods for data valuation and they typically uh, look at things like the shapely value for data valuation um so the shapely value is basically measuring the average marginal contribution uh, a player brings to all the correlations that involve, do not involve the player so essentially you take all possible subsets of other players and see how much um, this player contributes uh, to all the other coalitions, right? So that is what is measured uh, here. Uh, here, B is the utility function of the performance score. So the problem with this method is now, if you want to measure the performance, you need to have some independent validation data, typically at the server to measure the utility. And also, the second thing is it is very computationally expensive because now you are looking at all possible subsets uh, of uh, participants involved. So if there are n participants, there are two power n combinations that need to be evaluated in order to compute these shifty values. Because of these reasons, uh, more recent approaches have been proposed to uh, kind of approximate uh, the shifty value. And one of these methods is, was proposed in uh, New Europe's 2021 last year, where they used gradient-driven uh, approach. So the essential idea is, okay, why do we have to evaluate the participants' contribution every time on the uh, independent test set, right? So what they do is instead, they just look at the uh, gradients or the parameter updates from each of the participants. If it aligns well with the aggregated gradient, then it is given a higher uh, weightage. Whereas if the gradient of a participant is far away from the aggregated gradient, it means that, um, yeah, it means that basically that that participant is not contributing much to the learning process. So they use this cosine similarity between the participants parameter update and the aggregated one or all the participants as a proxy for the utility function. So this allows you to compute the utility function without actually uh, doing any inference on an independent test set. The second um, approximation which they do is, uh, I, to further simplify, they don't consider all possible subsets. They said, okay, you basically take the aggregated gradient from all participants and then see how much it deviates, how much this current participants gradient deviates from this uh, aggregated gradient, right? So it's basically UI is the, update from the participant i, and u of n is the um, aggregated parameter after uh, aggregating over all the participants, right? So you basically measure the similarity between these two, and that kind of gives you a good approximation of uh, how far away you are from the mean, right? The, the key benefits of this approach is it avoids the need for an independent validation set, and it is computationally very cheap. But the problem is it does not well work well for the non-IID settings. Um, so imagine if you have non-IID data, these gradients are not expected to be aligned along a similar direction. So right? each participant's gradient will be in a different direction. So in this case, uh, it is very difficult to um, compute the, the shapely value for a particular participant uh, using this approach. Okay, so now I'll move on to the uh, next subtopic, which is uh, dealing with uh, parasitic behavior or poisoning attacks on predator learning. So here the idea is some of the clients could be malicious um, and because of their uh, malicious or parasitic behavior, they can try to subvert the model learning process right? by either sending um, some random gradients or some kind of noisy gradients which does not allow the model to converge. Okay, so this can be either because the client itself is malicious or some attacker has taken over some of the, the client nodes or the participant nodes and inject malicious data, right? So it can be due to any reason. So the, the question is, how can we learn under this kind of, uh, um, in the presence of these kind of malicious clients? And the key challenge here is we have no control over um, what constitutes maliciousness, right? Because you can poison your data. For example, you can randomly flip the labels. So that will cause you to generate gradients which are useless. Uh, or you can actually use good data, but learn some uh, 
learn the model and then you add noise to the gradients or you completely replace it with some random gradients or change the direction of the gradients. So there is no end to the, uh, the type of uh, the number of ways in which you can modify the parameter updates. Right. So essentially, that's why we need something called a Byz Byzantine resilient period learning because we have no control over the attacker, what they can do. So all you can do is ensure that uh, even the worst possible case, we are able to do the learning. And the key idea here is, uh, again, it is very similar to the uh, cosine gradient based shapely value, right? If the core idea is majority of the participants uh, will have the gradients aligned in a particular direction. So if there is one participant whose gradients or updates are in a very different direction, then that participant should be ignored. So essentially you try to find updates that are too far away from the mean and you try to discard them during aggregation. Um, so you might ask, okay, how do, if I have a very strong outlier, then the mean itself is corrupted, right? So then there are various possible ways you can address this by using some things like trimmed mean or you can use the median uh, and there are various approaches which try different kinds of uh, ways in which you decide how to uh, get this, uh, the better gradient direction, right? Which is this blue line, which is the good direction that we need to move in. And then how to identify this uh, outlier here. So our recent work was also along these lines, but we took a slightly different approach. So we said, instead of computing the, computing the aggregate first, and then see how each participant is deviating from the aggregate, what we do is compute pairwise distance between the parameter updates. And then uh, this gives you a distance matrix, right? So if I have n participant and I get n parameter updates, I can compare pairwise. So I get an n by n matrix of distances. And then I can do some kind of outlier reduction on this distance space. So essentially I can say that, okay, um, this participant's gradients are far away from all the other participants so that will turn out as an outlier in this data right so we use something called as the popular based outlier detection on these distance matrices in order to uh, detect these outliers and then once you detect these outliers we can suppress them right we can assign weights to this uh, when you do the aggregation you can assign weights to the different uh, updates based on their uh, outlier scores. So if somebody, some participant has a high outlier score, then that the participant's uh, updates are suppressed. Whereas others which have a lower outlier score, they're given higher weight. So this is what is described with this uh, distance-based outlier suppression algorithm. So essentially uh, each participant first learns uh, uh, the local updates. And then once the participants send their local updates, we compute both the Euclidean and the cosine distances between the updates. So we get two matrices and we com uh, compute the outlier scores based on these two uh, matrices. And then we get the average outlier score and we use something like a softmax function to determine the weights for the uh, normalized weights for the, each of the clients. And then we use these normalized weights uh, in order to do the aggregation. So we have shown uh, on many data sets that uh, this kind of approach is actually quite good at uh, identifying malicious clients and suppressing them. So here I have shown uh, five cases. So the first case of the, of the leftmost one is a no attack case where all the participants are honest. They send their original gradient. Uh, the second case is like 10% uh, uh, label flip. So 10%, so in this case, there are 10 participants in total. So one of the participants um, basically does a random label flip on its data. So its gradients are not very reliable. And this method is able to identify it without specifying any other information. Right? Similarly, we try different kinds of attacks. Uh, we call it a mixed attack where we try to add noise to the gradients. Some of the gradients are random. Some of the cases you have a random flip of the data itself. Right? So we have this kind of mixed attack where uh, up to 40% of the clients can be uh, malicious and we are still able to detect all the malicious clients and we can see the weights which are given to these malicious client quickly converges to zero. And all the clients, other clients just come um, contribute to the learning process. So this we have done with different kinds of noise and different kinds of uh, scaling and so on. 
So what this experiment shows is that we can effectively resist poisoning attacks as long. The key assumption here is the majority of the participants are benign, which means they are honest and they are not trying to sabotage the system. So under this assumption, uh, this method is able to detect the malicious clients and suppress their contributions. So this table shows the uh, uh, final AUC uh, or the accuracy of the model after uh, federal learning training. So we can see that if there is no attack, uh, all the methods work reasonably well, right? So you get reasonably good accuracy, even for simple Fed averaging. And even for small amount of noise, Fed averaging works, works quite well. But then the moment the, uh, the number of malicious clients increases, to a closer to 30, 40% or closer to 50%, then um, the naive algorithms like federated averaging fail completely. So that is where uh, we show that our proposed method, which is the distance-based outlier suppression, is able to retain the original accuracy even with uh, this many number of malicious participants. And finally, I will just quickly touch upon this topic of uh, uh, privacy. So, as I mentioned in the first slide, the key assumption behind federated learning is that whatever um, parameter updates or gradients that you share does not leak any information about uh, your raw data. But then this assumption has been questioned uh, or shown to be wrong um, in many recent studies. Uh, for example, these two newest papers in 2019 and 2020 show that you can actually look at the gradients um, or the updates provided by the clients, and then the server or any malicious participant can try to uh, generate samples that match the gradients of uh, the client. And in doing so, they can probably reconstruct most of the client data, right? So you can see that, especially if you have a small batch size, you can reconstruct uh, the data with quite high accuracy. So this is where uh, we try to uh, improve upon uh, existing methods. So the standard approach to solve this problem is to uh, have differential privacy, right? So you basically use differential private noise to the add differential private noise to the gradients so that it improves the privacy. The problem with that approach is that it leads to large performance degradation. Um, so in our recent work, we try to add some kind of additional regularization uh, which we call as kurtosis-based gradient regularization. Um, the idea behind this approach is one of the problems um, with adding differentially private noise on top of gradients is that the gradients, some of the gradients are very large and some of them are very uh, small, right? So usually we use uh, some kind of specification, which basically says that, okay, if you have zero gradients, we kind of discard them and look at only the, uh, the most important gradients, right? And then if you try to add a noise on top of this uh, most important gradients, it affects either affects the accuracy or it has high sensitivity. So you need to add large amount of noise in order to conceal these gradients. So instead we try to take the opposite approach. Instead of sparsifying the gradients, we try to make the gra uh, gradients or the parameter uh, distribution more uniform. Right, so that is where the kurtosis based regularization helps. So we try to compute the kurtosis of the distribution of the parameter updates, and we want to, to make it closer to a uniform distribution. Here, this KT refers to the kurtosis of a uniform distribution, which is 1.8. Right, so we want to uh, we want to bring the gradients to more or less like a uniform distribution and add uh, differentially private noise on top of this regularized gradients or parameter updates. And we show that uh, this actually, for the ISO accuracy case, for the same accuracy, you can achieve better privacy guarantees if you do this regularization along with uh, DPSTD. So essentially, you can choose lower values of epsilon in a, a differentially private algorithm. And basically, that helps you uh, prevent against reconstruction. Right, so this here we show the reconstruction quality. Right, so higher the LPIPS means um, the lower the quality of reconstruction. So we are able to show that when you add this kurtosis regularization, you get poorer reconstruction for the same level of accuracy. So in summary, um, the key point which I would like to emphasize is most of the existing work in collaborative learning 
is primarily designed for the mutualistic scenario where participants are assumed to be honest and they're all trying to help each other. But uh, we need to extend these methods to non-mutualistic settings so that it can be applied in the real world because real world is always filled with these kind of non-mutualistic scenarios. So if you take any cross silo federated algorithm, uh, essentially most of the participants will be competitors, right? In the worst case, they are all competing for the same thing, for the same uh, customers. Right, so it is very naive to assume that uh, they will collaborate uh, for the mutual benefit of each other. So you need to design algorithms which work under these kind of competitive settings. And the key challenge in achieving that is uh, getting all the five properties simultaneously, which is so typical properties which you look at are privacy, accuracy, and efficiency. On top of that, we add the fairness, collaborative fairness, and the Byzantine robustness. And if you want to achieve all these five properties simultaneously, that is a very big challenge because there are many conflicting requirements. So if you want to achieve privacy, you want to hide your gradients, but then if you hide your gradients, it's very difficult to uh, estimate your contributions, right? So then how do you do that fairness? So there are many conflicting requirements among these five properties. So that's a big challenge. And still there are, uh, there's more room for developing more scientific and more efficient methods for this contribution assessment. So right now, still the contribution assessment is based on this inefficient shapely value. And that too, it just looks at data level contribution, right? So you can also look at computational contribution and things like that. So you need to broaden the scope for contribution assessment. And finally, we need to design more practical incentive mechanisms. Um, so, so far we haven't uh, really focused on that part uh, in our lab. But in future, we need to look at uh, ideas such as from game theory and reinforcement learning to come up with pol proper pol policy frameworks that kind of incentivizes participants uh, to do the right thing. So uh, with this, I end my talk and I'll be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Karthik. That was really excellent talk. Uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, please just post it to the chat or just raise your hand and I'll try to unmute you. Yeah, so let me just start things up. Uh, so do you think that actually like these, yeah, so, so, so do you think that there is actually a hope to address all of those conflict requirements together? So do, do you see that there might be actually a good framework that can like provide us with the right trade-off or like the best trade-off among those? Or you think that we would be kind of trying to addressing each of them like, like separately and then like trying to balance uh, once we're gonna deploy the model? Yeah, so I don't think there's a, it is possible to design something which achieves all five simultaneously, right? Yeah, we have that's to for sure. On something, so there yeah. has to be some trade-off. Uh, but the thing is to just raise the Pareto frontier, right? So you want to get a, achieve a better trade-off between different parameters, so you can come up with better algorithms which achieve a better trade-off. Uh, I don't think it is possible to completely eliminate the trade-off. Mm -hmm. Maybe then, I would have, yeah. And some might, it also depends on the application, right? For some applications, mm -hmm. you might compromise on one or two of these factors uh, in order to achieve better results from the other. Thank you. Yeah, and then maybe I'll have one more technical question regarding the first part of your talk. So regarding the FPP DDL. Yes. So I was wondering like how much actually, how scalable is that? Because it seems like that, that actually it might work only up to like reasonably small n or can you imagine like n number of like clients participating? Or do you think that is actually, it would work also with like the thousands of clients? No, I think this is mainly for the, I mean, the whole of decentralized yeah, learning correct. is for the cross-silo cross kind of settings. Mm -hmm. So for cross-device kind of things, uh, I don't think this approach will work. It is not scalable to that level. And for uh, the FDP, DDL, like, can you have a formal DP privacy guarantees? Um, so we can have formal guarantees uh, on each round and all that, but mm -hmm. uh, so we have this initial estimation. So that is what that is one of the weakness of that approach, right? 
So we need to start off with the, some initial credibility estimation. For that, mm -hmm. we had to kind of publish some synthetic samples. Yeah. Uh, so the moment you do that, uh, your privacy, get, although we try to do a differentially private GAN and all that, mm -hmm. uh, so we cannot ensure a differential privacy guarantee at that stage. I mean, the subsequent stages, we yes. can right? Yeah. So could you please maybe uh, talk a bit more about actually how you, because, because that's something I'm, I'm quite interested in, like how you actually do this DP gun, like how, how, how actually you get kind of differential privacy in, in uh, gun, guns. Yeah. Like how, how did you actually no. train that such that it's like, it's somehow private? I mean, we just follow the same uh, differential. I mean, when you train the GAN, you try oh. to ensure that you are not actually using the original gradients for training process, but you add oh. noise to the gradients. So okay. that's how we get the differential. Yeah, but it doesn't guarantee you much. I mean, you can, uh, because eventually the full data is released, the synthetic data is released, right? Mm -hmm. Once it's that, it becomes a problem. So yeah, some like, of work, I think uh, some of our more recent work where we try to encrypt the data and mm -hmm. then do directly encrypted inference on this data can address that issue. Yes. So then we do a private GAN. So then we can have uh, do that initial step in a secure way or like a privacy preserving way. And mm -hmm. then we can achieve the differential privacy guarantees. Yeah. Because I guess like, but but even like if you train with DP, then it doesn't matter that whether you release the data set or not, it's not going to be less DP, right? That's kind of a, that's a good feature of, of, of yeah, that's DP. that's a good feature. Yeah. yeah. So, so but and, still some of the things, right? So let's say I train and release, uh, uh, I mean, there are, you can come up with specific cases where let's say other participants don't have a particular class, but the moment you release your data, it kind of leaks some information about that class. Yeah. Right. And uh, how was the actually like uh, how were the samples? Did, did you actually check like uh, uh, what was that kind of the quality of the samples? Where it looked like uh, nice, but the, the kind of like it looked private, or it was like kind of distorted? Maybe like when you were it's generating like images. I had some images, but I didn't put it in the presentation. Okay. But it's more like distorted versions of the original images. Okay. But you can still see the class. I mean, mm -hmm. so let's say MNES, right? You can still see the digit somehow. Mm -hmm. but it's a distorted version of that, of the original samples. Okay. Yes, you. Thank you again. Let's just uh, maybe let's just wait uh, one minute if somebody has a question. So, so please do not hesitate to ask the question, either post it to the chat or just raise your hand. Okay, so there is a question by Alexander. Let me just try to unmute Alexander. Yeah, so I mean, there's no majority voting as such, but if um, if more than 50% of the collaborators are 40, then this approach doesn't work. Right, that's true, uh, because then there's no difference between an outlier, right? So the good samples or the benign samples or benign updates become the outlier. Yeah, please go forward. Yeah. Yeah, especially in the case that when I mean this is Byzantine, right? So you can there's no restriction on parties colluding with each other. So if you have a majority of the parties which are malicious and then they can collude with each other, then they can easily break the system because now the benign participants become the outlier. So uh, I would have a follow-up question on that. Um, so that probably means, uh, if I understand correctly, the way you compute those differences and the average gradient moving, basically, of the uh, people that actually want to <laughs> collaborate, um, that would mean that at the start of the training, you're very, very likely to um, kind of deviate in the wrong direction, right? So it would probably mean, because the gradients are all over the place at the very start of the model, in case it's randomized, uh, like initialized randomly, that would probably mean that you can have less than 50% of people doing like faulty collaborations, and that could move the model 
a lot, right? Because the way you do like this averaging would yeah. kind of presume so, that you move all in the right direction. So that's true. Uh, if you look at the graphs carefully, uh, if you look at the simple federated averaging, it converges quite quickly. Uh, and the propose all the other methods, right? Whatever, whenever we try to do some kind of uh, robust aggregation, uh, the convergence becomes slower. Right. Eventually, it converges to the same values, but you need to run it for a larger number of iterations in order to achieve the same final accuracy. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, what you say is somewhat correct. The, in the initial stages, we are not sure which one is uh, malicious and which one is uh, benign. Right? But if you look at uh, these graphs, right, the ones below, we see that it quickly, so in, except in some cases, right? And so in this 40% attack case, um, we can see that the, there is the initial, these malicious clients are still contributing in the initial stages, and it takes mm -hmm. some time for them, for these contributions to go to zero, to suppress these contributions. If the number of clients is not, number of malicious clients is not very high, then we can quickly converge to zero. So, which is shown in this uh, second column. So, in this third and fourth column, it also depends on the kind of attack that you do. So, if you do a more fine grain kind of attack, it becomes more difficult to uh, detect it. So that particular participant might still be contributing and uh, pushing the model in a different direction during the initial stages. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that is why the, uh, the things are very different, right? So in this case, if you just add, simply add noise, it's very easy to detect. But if yeah. you do a mixed yeah. attack with different kinds of things, then it's more difficult to attack, uh, to detect. Yeah, it's very interesting. Like to me, it seems like this non-IAD situation. I'm not really sure I fully grasp like the the way maybe the gradients move in such a like high dimension in that regard. But I could have kind of like from your nice visualization um, as to how you try to detect or like do this cosine difference basically between the the malicious gradients and the, the um, collaborative gray or like the not faulty gradients. It seems to me like that at the very start of the training, it are they really moving in a similar direction if the data is really like really non-IAD? Like imagine the worst case scenario where you have one yeah. class on one machine and another class on another machine, they won't be similar at all, right? Or yeah, so we haven't tested the extreme case, but we did try non-IAD with uh, where different participants have different proportions of uh, different classes, right? So we tried that up, um, that kind of setting. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, it, it results in a slightly lower performance, but it still converges. Um, so that was our observation. So as long as it is not, so if you, in the extreme case that you're talking about where each participant has a different class, then probably this method will find it hard to converge. Mm -hmm. Okay. On the yeah, other hand, if you assume there's some overlap between the different participants, uh, then there's some hope. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's definitely like an interesting case, I think, for, for the different methods to, to think about and like because you really don't know when those methods are going to be applied, right? So in what kind of non-IED scenario they will be applied. So it's an interesting fault scenario to, to consider, I would say. But yeah, very nice talk. Yeah, Thank you very much. Yeah.